Well, welcome to the Good Talk Podcast, where we remind you of the joy of life, the love of God, and the possibilities that lie ahead. Pete and Jordan here with episode 88. When tragedy strikes, a discussion on the Nashville school shootings. Yep. So today's podcast is obviously a little different than uh, the vast majority of our podcast, uh, in that uh, we had something take place here in Nashville this week that we just felt like we couldn't ignore, we couldn't yeah. just like... Shouldn't ignore. Right, shouldn't ignore. Uh, and so I understand that the whole format of this is not our normal format, it's not our normal probably even energy level, but I think it's a really important conversation mm-hmm. uh, around what happened in Nashville this week with the school shooting. And I understand, again, a large majority of those of you who uh, watch this on YouTube or listen uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, don't necessarily live in Nashville, but I feel like this has been a, a story that's kind of gripped the whole nation and a lot of emotion around it, a lot of debate about what should happen moving forward. And so I just wanted to, again, from our humble perspective, talk a little bit about what happened, how it's impacted us. And it, and then also, I, I want to give you guys uh, a couple things today around the idea of grief and how you deal with grief because obviously school shootings aren't the only thing that bring up grief these days we live in a very broken messed up world at times and uh even beyond that there's just things in our everyday life i think that we we have to work through grief and so i want to talk a little bit about what is grief how do you work through it uh and and then also pro- probably more than we've done on any podcast i won't throw you into the under the bus on this but i i do i have some personal pretty passionate personal thoughts mm-hmm. around what happened this week and and how we can how we could see this happen less mm-hmm. in America yeah and not everybody's going to agree with my thoughts I'll share those towards the end that's okay we can still be friends uh, but I think it's important uh, for me to share some thoughts around uh, around that yeah so just tell me Jordan for you this week uh, as everything unfolded, and we don't have to go into all the details, but you'd have to be living under a rock to not have heard what happened. But obviously, a shooter entered a local Christian school. There were three students killed, three adults killed, and the shooter uh, was killed by police. Seven deaths total, six victims. Um, it brought up a lot of emotion for us. Mm-hmm. Why do you think this struck? accord so deeply with us and then really with people ar- around the country? Well, I mean, besides the obvious, I think anytime children are involved, it just enrages people in a different yeah. way because they're so helpless. And um, we put a lot of trust in people and systems to, you know, have them live their life when we're not always right there. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, the obvious, I'm not even going to why necessarily it it was sad because we all know why it's sad and why it hurts. I think you and I felt this one uniquely, obviously because it's so close. Yeah. Um, and not that you need it to be in like a close proximity to feel deep emotion. I mean, we've felt deeply for every situation that, you know, happens like this. Unfortunately it's happened a lot. Um, so anytime we hear of a school shooting or any kind of, you know, evil like this, it obviously breaks our hearts. But I think, just the natural as a human, when it's right down the road from you, it makes you think, oh gosh, this could have been my kid, yeah, you know? absolutely. And um, uh, that should probably, that chord should be struck anyways, no matter where it is. But again, just the human side is this was 15 minutes down the road from us. What if Pepper was a little older and in school there? You just, you go through all the things and the what ifs and you always think you're kind of safe from this evil that seems just surreal and unreal. Um, and then when it's down the street, it's like, I'm not, she's yeah. not. Um, and so I think that's why, and obviously when it's local, you do have degrees of separation. You're like, Oh, this, you know, a few families in our neighborhood, their kids go there and, um, you just, it becomes very human and personal. Um, so I think that's why it just like really struck us to our core. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's just no, there are no words. Yeah, I, I think I was, I was caught off guard with how emotional I was about it. Again, I've been upset anytime I've seen something like this happen in our country or anywhere in the world for that matter. But 
I don't think I realized how much proximity would intensify the grief or the anxiety of uh, probably having, you know, I've, I have three kids, three older kids, and then a younger daughter. And I, I think there is something about when you have a kid that's under the age of five, they seem so vulnerable. And this attack being on school age kids, it just felt I don't know, I, like we could identify on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because I, I, I wanted to research a little bit more about like just my own grief I was feeling and was reading about this as a concept that I, I'm aware of the concept, I wasn't aware of the term collective grief. And this idea of collective grief is when um, a group of people like a city, or a country, or those belonging to a particular race or ethnicity, share an extreme loss. So, you know, and 9-11 would have probably been one of the last experiences. Uh, I take that back. In 2010 in Nashville, we had a devastating flood where dozens were killed, thousands of people lost their home. I felt that collective grief then. Mm -hmm. I felt it on 9-11, certainly. Mm -hmm. There was a collective grief around the country of great loss. Uh, and I and I really felt it on Monday as well. This collective grief of something has happened in our community. There have been lives that have been taken that will these kids will never go home. The adults will never see their spouse again or their own kids. But but that idea of collective grief kind of made sense with me. And it, and it doesn't it doesn't always have to be the loss of life. Uh, I think I, COVID. I think brought about a sense of collective grief yeah, now and there was loss of life but but a good number of us didn't experience that but we still felt that we we felt a loss of something and it's just the experience of sharing grief with other people and i think that's that's what we were feeling don't you yeah for sure it just again there's uh, of course like i don't want to have to experience those things to also feel that collective mentality because there is something really strong about that you mm -hmm. know like just knowing all these families coming together parents coming together today in nashville there was a big um kind of gathering at the capitol like that is a powerful feeling yeah. um to feel like okay we're in this together but yeah i think it it it's it has felt that way. It's felt that way everywhere we've gone. You're in the grocery store and you see people talking and it, you know what they're talking about, you know, and it's, I, I feel like in the neighborhood, there's been so many beautiful things that are happening, like, you know, trying to gather funds for the families or, mm. you know, hotel rooms for people that are going to be coming in and visiting. Like there is a, a really human side to the, um, to the grief part collectively as well. But yeah, I think it's, it's been interesting to watch. Yeah. I think you know, when I look back on Monday and, and these following co past couple of days, um, I, I think there have been some some levels of this, some things that stirred up in, in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for one, and you already touched on this, events like school shootings make people realize that ultimately death murder, whatever you want to call it, is, is possible for all of us. Like, because that, that seems, you know, even with all the school shootings that have happened in, in our history, especially over the past 20 years, I still think there's something inside of all of us that feel like a school should be safe. Yeah. That's why it's so shocking to us. And then when the, the proximity plays into it, as what you said, is like, this is a school 15 minutes away that our daughter easily could have been at. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, th these kind of th horrific things that you see happen are not just something that could happen to other people. They're things that could happen to us. Right. And there's a vulnerability that comes along with that mm -hmm. when you realize, oh my gosh, this could have been me. Mm -hmm. This could have been my kids. Mm-hmm. We, we live in a sort of artificial bubble, I think, where we think we're safe, we think we're protected, we think we have control over most of the elements in our life. And then when something like that happens, it's like, boom, it bursts that bubble and you realize that all control that you think you've had is actually an illusion of control that's yeah. been propping you up. Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's a scary thing. Mm -hmm. I think that we were also reminded, uh, unfortunately, on Monday, that we live in a very broken world where some senseless slash evil things happen. And as much as I love where I live, as much as I love the world that we live in, I every once in a while I'm just reminded that, you know, it's a broken place. Mm -hmm. 
and and along with that comes a lot of pain and a lot of agony and things happen that shouldn't happen bad things happen to good people and it seems like you know i know a lot of people would ask him how like where is god in all of that and you know what even as someone who's a pastor for decades i still ask those same questions mm-hmm. like how how can that happen and in the most academic theological response i i can ever bring to the table is just we live in a broken world and we have freedom of choice and along with that comes some terrible things but i hate to be reminded of that mm-hmm. yeah that's that's just the that's a sobering thought a little bit it's just it's you're right you don't want to be reminded of it we know it um and i think that element like you just said the element of just the brokenness of the world that is what feels the most out of contr- out of our control right mm-hmm. like we can get into legislation and things like that that should be talked about. Um, and that feels like there's a little more potential for control. It's the brokenness and some of the evil that's like, how how do you ever, you know, control that? And that's where it feels really helpless. Um, so I think that's that's the hard part to like that pill to swallow is like you you can't we can never pretend to, that we'll live in a world where there won't be people with mental health problems that make ridiculous decisions, you know? And I think that awareness sucks. And again, not to say that there aren't things that can need to be bolstered up around that. Um, you said it well the other, t- or I think it was this morning, you said there are a lot of facets to this. Some of it you cannot control yep. and some of it you can. Uh, but that that piece right there to me is a very like, oh, we can't control that. And it, you're right, it just sucks to have that awareness. Yep. So here's some things, because we're we're all going to have these tragic moments in our life that bring on a tremendous amount of grief. It may be the loss of a loved one, loss of a child, uh, something like this that happens in your community or inside of your faith community. And I think it's important to talk for just a minute about how, how you process that. So I'm kind of doing this in real time with myself this week. But the first thing that I wrote down on my notes was you got to allow yourself to feel. Mm-hmm. Like it's normal to have increased anxiety when you're processing something as disturbing and as tragic as somebody walking into a school and shooting six people, right? Like there'd probably be something a little wrong with you if that didn't move you one way or the other, mm-hmm. right? And so... What I know is that avoiding what you're feeling isn't going to eliminate the anxiety or the grief. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anyone out there that would ever suggest that bearing any feeling at all is ultimately going to be good for your health, right? You have to remind yourself that fear is a human emotion. You're allowed to experience it. Give yourself an opportunity to reflect on the anxiety, the fear, the grief, and begin to process that. Mm -hmm. And... um, you know, I, I like for me. I had a moment. Well, we we both we've had we've had a couple moments. We both had a moment. We were crying in the car together. Mm-hmm. Um, when as it was unfolding, we were listening to it. And I had another moment later that day in the car where I lost it, and it. I I just needed that. Mm-hmm. I needed that. Like that was important for me to feel that in that moment, and not just kind of shove that down or blow it off or not pay attention to it. I really needed to feel that in that moment. And I think you have to feel things in order to do something about it. Yes. Um, In this case of grief, obviously this can involve other things than just like your own healing. There Mm -hmm. are other things that can be put in, you know, your own actions can start to help other things change. But um, yeah, I just feel like until you allow yourself to really feel that, your passions won't drive your actions until you can, yeah. you know? So I just think that's a very important step. Yep. So you got to feel it. Second thing I wrote down is you got to find a release. And again, I just kind of talked about one of our releases was just being emotional, just mm-hmm. crying. Like that's, that's a, that is part of a release of grief. It's a part of the processing, but there's other ways too, right? There's prayer, uh, which I know is really helpful for a lot of people. There's creative outlets that can help whether you journal or do some art or fall into your music or write or read poetry. L- literally putting this podcast together and the notes for this podcast were part of that outlet for me. Mm-hmm. That was part of me finding a release for what I was feeling was how can I create something that might help me and also at the same time help other people. Yeah. And and that that was important for me. Yeah, that's good. That, what I, I hate to put you on the spot with this, but 
what what's a release for you when you feel grief when you feel anxiety as deep as you have this week Mm, I think uh, I definitely cry (laughs) but um I think a lot of times seeing the release is like seeing the helpers and trying to be a part of the helpers Mm. um finding ways to do that researching ways to do that I've looked into that um I think my whole life something I've really loved to do is try to help people that are overlooked and surely these people are not necessarily overlooked right now. The whole world is looking at them, but um, I think some of the actions that can help prevent this in the future are overlooked right now. Um, Not, not necessarily like in the masses, it's obviously a highlight right now, but I think in my heart, the way that I can like have any sort of peace is knowing what we can do, what I can do, um, and just trying to figure that out because otherwise I, I do, I feel like I swim in this sorrow of like helplessness. Mm. And so maybe this is part of like me trying to control something like I am unable to do anyways, but, um, I do, I feel like trying to find ways to help is a little bit of a release Yeah, and running. I like and to run. run. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You process when you run. Uh, other thing I wrote down, third thing was uh, limit media consumption. Um, I think that you can be informed about something without having to allow the news to destroy your mental health. Mm-hmm. And there's a line there. I don't know where it is. It's probably different for everybody. But we had our moments where we had to kind of turn things off for a while. Uh, you know, it's at, it's at that point where you realize, okay, there's no new information here. We're just kind of actually almost using this to numb us where we don't actually have to personally process this. Mm -hmm. We're just listening to the same information over and over and over. So I actually think that there's an element of numbing into that. Mm -hmm. So you can stay informed without allowing it to completely consume you. Yeah. And I think obviously there are some families that don't have the option of that not consuming them. Um, So that's a different situation, obviously. Um, but yeah, in this situation, as far as being able to grieve it, feel it and find out how you move forward, that is a really good point just to let it like stay aware, stay aware of the facts, how you can help. And then from there, you just kind of have to put a foot in front of the other after you've grieved. Yep. Totally. Which leads me to the fourth thing I wrote down, which is do something Mm -hmm. like grief. One of the most powerful things about grief and, and the impact it has is that it makes us feel helpless that's what makes that emotion so strong there's a feeling of helplessness that comes along with that and taking action can help now here's where i'm going to get myself into trouble (laughs) willingly like i'm fine with that and here's here's the thing this is a no-win situation because i'm not going to make anybody on any side of this any of these issues happy because they're probably going to think i'm not strong enough or i'm not taking it far enough so i'm fine with that that's that's great um but i feel like i need to add this in there when we're talking about do something so there are ideas right like write a letter to congress uh if you want to march go march if you want to attend a vigil service attend a vigil service and pray with people in your community if you want to write a letter to victims families do that if you want to donate to one of their gofundme things do that do whatever you feel convicted to do the the thing is this and this is what i i want to encourage you to be careful of when it comes to doing something when these tragic events happen, I, I think one of the most irritating things for me is people take their prepackaged agendas and then attach it to a traumatic event. And it feels a little dirty to me. So the, the, that. These are people that at times have really no uh, vested interest in the tragedy that's happened. I can't speak for their hearts, so I can't say whether it breaks their heart or doesn't break their heart, moves them or doesn't move them. It's just clear when minutes after something like this happens, a politician stands up and reminds people of their personal bill that they think fixes this. It just feels dirty to me. And maybe that's judgmental, but uh, it just feels like a prepackaged, like we have some uh, media statements that are ready to roll for anything positive or neg- negative that happens around the country. When that happens, press play on that. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. But nonetheless, the reality is everybody comes at it from their different perspective. So for some people, this is a gun control issue. 
For other people, it's a school security issue. For other people, it's a mental health issue, right? And so um, is there a, a gun problem in our country? I think there is. Is there a mon- mental health problem in our country? Yes, I think there is. Is there a school security issue in our country? Yes, I think there is. I don't think there's one lane you're going to pick that you can get in that lane and think that it's going to fix everything. Now, I'm fine with you picking a lane and saying this is a good lane. It may not solve it all, but I'm going to I'm going to go after this. And you know, I mean, again on the the gun thing, it's just gosh, it's, I'm so tired of like the same debate happening every time. Listen, I love guns. <laughs> I'm now I'm taking off the other side. I do. I love guns. I own guns. I've hunted since I was 12 years old. My boys all hunt. We have numerous guns that we hunt with. So I'm in no way an anti-gun person, right? Uh, I I want a handgun. I've been telling you that. I would like that. I want a handgun, right? So that's fine. Okay. So I'm I'm not anti-gun. But this idea that somehow we can't limit uh, some of the guns that are available these days, these high-powered AR rifles, I, I just, I, correct me if I'm wrong, and please send me an email or text me or whatever, but I just don't see a reason we need them. Who needs a high-powered AR-15 rifle with, again, the difference is this for people to understand. My hunting guns can handle one or two shells or cartridges. That's it. You shoot, you know, whatever animal you're hunting, and if you miss, it's over. They're gone because it's going to take you a minute to reload, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you couldn't kill somebody with those those things because you certainly could. You're not going to do a mass shooting with those guns. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen. It's, it's impossible. Somebody's going to tackle you as soon as you run out of your two shells. These are guns that have magazines with hundreds of cartridges i i just don't understand like why they're so readily available yeah you don't have to agree with me no i i'm i'm uneducated on guns like i didn't really even know what a shotgun was until i met you (laughs) so i've not really been around a lot of guns in my life but i do i totally agree there's no sport if you're using gun for sport there's no sport that needs an ar um, from a protection standpoint, there are other options in guns. Um, so I totally agree. Like ARs are just yep. unnecessary. And listen, I have a lot of friends who will adamantly disagree with me about this. They have those guns and they use them in a, in a, I guess, a somewhat safe manner. You know, they love to go out somewhere and shoot targets and all that. I get that. That sounds fun. It's just not worth the it's risk. It's just not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth what's happening to our kids in our country. It's just not. And I am just absolutely confused at why we can't get any movement on this. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think it's sad. But I also, look, I'll play the other side of the coin. I think it's absolutely naive for the people who think that's the only issue here. And then if somehow we were to ban assault weapons, that there's not going to be any more school shootings. That's so naive. Um, and I would say you're wrong too. I think it helps. I don't know why we don't do it. But if that's the only thing that you think is going to fix this problem, then I think you're barking up the wrong tree. I I think it's a multifaceted uh, issue. And I think that mental health, the way, you know, again, so many of these school shooters, you know, have these stories of how they were bullied of how they were mistreated, of how they became an outsider. Like there are just so many different ways that I think we need to attack this problem and not just look at it as one thing. Yeah. And we don't know the entire like manifesto of this shooter. I know that they mentioned she likely had an emotional disorder. Um, We don't know the details of that. So I'm not like putting that on her, but I think that was part of her situation. But yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of things at play. Um, And I think do like you said, find a way that like however you're convicted in that way go for it and tackle yep. it because there's gonna be other people convicted of the other angle or maybe there's you're convicted on all of it like there are ways that we can all kind of come together and help solve this but again it has to it just has to be action has to be taken yeah. and what really sucks and i'm sure a lot of people echo this what really sucks is this stuff happens we talk about it for a few weeks 
and then it like dissipates because the sting is gone and yep. your your passion and, and all of that just kind of starts to get watered down because maybe you took a step forward and you took an action step and you're waiting and you never, nothing ever happens. And so like there's only so much you can do. So I understand why that happens. I'm, I am so guilty of that. I'm not acting like I'm the one on the front lines either. Um, but I do think that that's what really makes me mad and why I think everyone gets so mad when it happens again. It's like, when, how many of these yeah. things need to happen for yep. something to happen? But anyway. Yeah. Well, my last one, I know we're running out of time. I think it's important as you're processing grief is strengthen your mental health. This is, a, this is not a time to stop doing the things you know you should be doing that produce mental health. Simple things like sleep and exercise and eating well and drinking enough water. I think you have to be really careful. Grief is, grief is different than depression, but they have a whole lot of the same symptoms. And, the, and probably the biggest difference, in my opinion, between grief and depression um, is they used to say it was grief didn't last as long, that depression was was grief over an extended period of time. We've backed up from that, and I think most professionals now believe that there's no timeline on grief. Yeah. But the big difference is depression, people with depression often want to be isolated and not around other people. Yeah. And with grief, that's not necessarily so. You still see people with grief that are gathering together, that are seeking community. And I just think that's an important element to point out. Yeah, and I I love this illustration. They talk about grief like... You don't necessarily move on from grief. You grow around grief. Like yeah. grief is kind of yeah. all things like that always happen and it sticks with you. And so I feel like to be able to grow around it and heal around it, you have to be very aware of your own mental health through it. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I think elements of grief when you really feel them don't go away. You just grow around. Yeah. So you have to, you have to really work at that, which is hard. Um, and gosh, we're at such a low level of grief compared to these families and, Mm. um, the direct community of those, of those, um, poor children and adults who are killed in that, um, shooting. So I'm, we're sick by it. I, the amount of times I've said this sucks is (laughs) endless this week. You said it four times on this podcast. I know this sucks. It just sucks. Um, I have no, no, (laughs) No, like pretty words for it. Um, I've had some love, some very harsh words this week. So, anyways, um, thank you. Uh, absolutely, really and I know we don't normally do this, but I thought maybe I'd just end this uh, with prayer. Okay. All right, dear God, thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for the podcast. Thanks for those that are listening right now, wherever they might be, whether they're in their car or on a jog, um, and especially for those that are hurting, reeling from the events that happened this week in Nashville. God, we pray for those families. Pray for the kids and the things that they had to see and they had to witness. We pray for our country because uh, we've been reminded once again uh, that we live in a broken world. And everybody's trying to figure out how we fix it. And ultimately, God, we we know that only you can do that. And so we lean on you and we trust in you, even in difficult times like this where we just simply can't find words, we can't find explanations for why this kind of thing happens. I just pray that when we can't figure it out, that we just lean into you, that we trust in you, that we're reminded once again that we are all loved deeply, we're forgiven much. Uh, and that ultimately love is the answer to all this. And so help us to do the one thing I know that we can all do that can make the greatest difference, which is love the people around us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go do something.